Well, amen. It's a privilege to pray for one another, isn't it? And, uh, you know, we uh, used to just have one of us pastors lead in prayer, and we started breaking up and having the instruments play uh, towards the end of prayer time because there's a reason why we pray and then we have the message is because when we used to reverse it, unfortunately, people would leave as soon as the message is over. So uh, the way to get you to stay through prayer time is to have prayer time first. Uh, but, uh, and so uh, we would just lead in prayer. And um, dear saint of the Lord who's in glory now, Connie Walkowitz said, you know, we did that at our church, but we would have them play to let us know when to stop praying for the message. And so we started doing this where we pray together again, and that has been such a blessing to my soul. I hope that it's been a blessing to you to pair up with somebody and to pray with them. Well, if you have your Bibles, take them to Proverbs. We'll be uh, mostly in the book of Proverbs tonight. And last week, we talked about the importance of work. And work is not a four-letter word. We were made to work. Work was important before the fall, That's why God put Adam in the garden, was to work in the the garden. And uh, tonight we're going to talk about the sin of slothfulness, the sin of slothfulness. In other words, we don't always think about it, that laziness or idleness in God's eyes is sin. And there's many practical and biblical examples of why we can say that it is a sin. In fact, in 1 Timothy 5, 8, Scripture tells us that if a man does not provide for his own, especially for those of his own household, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. In other words, if, if you are lazy and you aren't a provider, you are somebody who has denied the faith. You are a faithless person. Faith does not reside in you. That's the example that you're setting And you are like an infidel, an unbeliever. So when we don't think of laziness as a sin, and listen, I understand there's times where we've got to come apart. Because if you don't come apart, eventually you will come apart, right? So God created the world in six days. On the seventh day, He rested. That's a good principle, that we need to have a Sabbath day, a day of rest, a day to to relax. But many times, it's not just a day, it's our entire days, it's the weeks, it's the time uh, we become lazy in our mindset, become lazy in our work, and we become lazy in our spiritual walk. Scripture speaks very clearly about this. In fact, in James 2, it says, those who know to do good and don't do it, to them it is sin. That's sins of omission. That's a lazy person who says, I know I should do this, but I'm not. So laziness, slothfulness, is always paired with an unbeliever, a fool, or a sinful person. And in fact, it's an attribute or a characteristic of somebody who walks according to their own desires. I can tell you there's times where I'm guilty of that. When the kids ask me to do something with them and the response is, I just want to veg. I don't feel like doing it. Well, the lazy person lives by the feeling of my own desires and what makes me happy, and that means idleness and doing nothing. Now, I want you to think for just a minute because uh, in our society, uh, we are dealing with this a lot. In fact, if you're in California now, I guess you can steal $950 worth of stuff and you don't get penalized for it. You won't even get arrested. So, you can go to a store Calculate $949 worth of items, walk out of the store, and there's nothing you can do uh, with it. So I want you to think a minute, though, about a thief. A lot of times we think about a thief because they take something that doesn't belong to them. Any of you all have ever had somebody take something from you, a thief has stolen from you? You know how that feels, right? You feel betrayed that they've taken something that does not belong to them. But, you know, there is a deeper level, actually, to a thief. You see, a thief wants something they didn't work for. You see, that's, that's what it comes down to. That's the heart issue of a thief. A thief wants something that they didn't work for. And that is an attribute or a characteristic of laziness. So, laziness is not actually founded in ignorance, but a willful negligence or disobedience. 
The lazy person that we're going to find in Proverbs tonight is somebody who just doesn't care. There's a quote that says, hard work pays off in the future, but laziness pays off now. And please understand, tonight this message is not an attack or putting down of those who are no longer physically able to do things. We're not talking about that. This is a theme, and Proverbs, the theme of laziness is those who are able but don't and won't. So first of all, how do you pick the lazy person out? How do you know if they're lazy or not? Well, first of all, we're going to see the characteristics of a lazy person, the characteristics of a lazy person. In Ecclesiastes 10.18 It tells us, by much slothfulness, the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands, the house droppeth through. Now, this is actually a great analogy to a kingdom or to a monarchy. In other words, without proper attention and work, things will deteriorate. That's the natural process. Things will deteriorate. Every one of us understands this principle, and much like the parable of the talents, even though we know that we have been asked to do something, and we even know what we need to do, sometimes laziness looks more attractive than accomplishment. Something that we all understand, but we need a reminder of, is greatness takes work. Greatness takes work. So, what are some characteristics? Well, first of all, they want for ambition. They want for ambition. In other words, it's something that is lacking in their life. Sometimes we just need a good old kick in the pants. It's called gumption. (laughs) Now, you've probably heard two phrases in your life. The early bird gets the worm. And good things come to those who wait. Now, those almost seem like contradictory statements, but however, they are based on two separate principles. The early bird gets the worm is based on the principle of getting out early and getting the job done, not procrastinating. Now, in our household, We use this phrase that we got from a leadership conference, you need to swallow the big frog first. All right, so that's what we'll say in our household. Let's swallow the big frog first. Let's get the most important, the most pressing issue done. The early bird gets the worm. Let's get out there and do it. Let's not procrastinate, not let wait for somebody else. We're going to do it. The idea, though, of good things come to those who wait doesn't mean that you work. It means that you don't work. It means that you are trusting the Lord and you're looking to the Lord and you're not going to get ahead of yourself. It does not mean you don't work. We are told to trust in the Lord, and this does not mean in action. I know that there's a lot of times where we'll talk with people, especially uh, about doing things, service, and they're like, well, I'll pray about it. Well, I'm just going to see if the Lord leads me to do it. Well, why don't you start moving that direction to see if the Lord leads you some other place? So we need to trust Him for guidance, but that a guidance assumes that we are moving. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your steps, your path. And so here's what do we know is there's an assumption that as you are going along the way or going along the path and you trust in Him, He will direct you. But the assumption is that you are already moving. So many say they can't get God's guidance when they really mean they wish He would show them an easier way. I'm going to repeat that again. Many say they can't get God's guidance, but what they really mean is they wish He would show them an easier way. So don't attribute a lack of ambition to faith. Well, I'm just going to wait on the Lord. No, do something for the Lord. Don't want for ambition. Have some holy gumption. In Proverbs 26, 14, it says, As the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful person upon his bed. 
The slothful hide his hand in his bosom. It grieveth him to bring it again to his mouth. And just like a door on the hinges, just toss and turn. Hey, that bed looks really good right now. I'm not getting out of bed for anything. And then this is how much laziness affects your life. This person is actually sitting at a table, and instead of looking at his hand with a knife, a spoon, or a fork in it, you know what he does? He hides it and then says, it's too much work to even eat even though I'm hungry. Even hunger does not motivate a lazy person at times. In fact, there are two powerful words in this verse that you might want to underline. First of all, where it says hideth, where it says hideth his hand. That Hebrew word means to conceal or bury. Have you ever heard the phrase, out of sight, out of mind? In other words, if I don't see the work, I won't have to do the work. So this man sitting at the table and he realizes, man, it's going to actually just take work to feed myself. I'd rather not even look at my hand than have to imagine about doing work. The principle there is as many times if we just hide it, we just shove it all over, we just throw the bedspread over everything, we don't have to worry about the work. We don't have any ambition. And then the second word, though, is it says this, it grieveth him to bring it again to his mouth. That word grieveth there means to be weary or loath. We understand that loathe word because all of us have asked our children to clean their rooms, and how do they respond? Oh. It says, it grieveth him to bring it again to his mouth. In other words, it's just too difficult. It's inconvenient. In Proverbs 19.24, it says, A slothful man hideth his hand in his bosom, same principle, and will not so much as bring it to his mouth again. Twice, it's saying this person would rather hide work than have to look at work as a reminder of what he needs to do. That is a lazy person. No goals, no ambition, no gumption, no drive. Spurgeon said this, Work is always healthier for us than idleness. It is always better to wear out shoes than sheets. Not only do they want for ambition, but they waste resources and potential. They waste resources and potential. In Proverbs 18.9, it says, He also that is slothful in his work is a brother to him that is a great waster. That word, great waster, uh, can understand it in these terms. It's like a great destroyer. How many of you have ever seen, and I've seen this many times, many places driving through a neighborhood or someplace, and somebody began to build a house, and then it stopped, and it's grand. I still don't think the eye for eyesore has ever been finished. I think it still remains unfinished 20 plus years later. Do you all know what I'm talking about, the I-4 eyesore? Okay, it's, it's, Doug knows. You, it's still there, right? Unfinished. But you go by some of these buildings and you see them and they were going to be nice and they are unfinished. You know what we say when we see those? What a waste. What a waste. You see, a lazy person wastes resources and potential. It says that they are a great destroyer. They leave things half done or they never start. Proverbs 12, 27 says, The slothful man roasteth not that which he took in hunting, but the substance of a diligent man is precious. So we just got to stop right there because I know we've got some hunters and fishers in the room tonight. There is nothing more exciting when, when you're fishing, especially if you're doing some saltwater fishing, and you just got that rod is just bent over. And the great thing about saltwater fishing is you never know what's on the other end of that line. Have no idea. 
and you're just reeling, and you, sometimes you have an idea, by the way, that they fight. Oh, this is going to be good, and you get to the boat, and the thrill of catching that fish, whatever it is, you know, if it's a slot snook or something like that, just the thrill is just so great, and you get your picture, and you're like, yeah, I'm going to keep that fish, can't wait to eat that thing, but then you get done with your fishing day, and then the fish is with its dead eyeballs from being ice is looking at you, and looking at the fish, it's like, you know, it was really fun to catch, but I really don't want to clean that thing. It's fun to catch. Oh, shooting the deer is fun. But then you got to do what? You got to gut it and strip it. And that's not so, so much fun, is it? It's kind of dirty, nasty, smelly work. So the slothful man does not take advantage of his opportunities. He enjoys the hunt, but begrudges the work. The hardworking, though, what do they get to do? They get to enjoy the fruits of their labors. See, it says the diligent man is precious. In other words, the diligent man who field dresses that deer or who gets that fish and guts that and cleans that fish up and comes home, what does he get to do? He gets to enjoy that fish. He gets to enjoy that deer. He gets to enjoy the spoils. But it took work to get it from the field or from the water to the plate. The lazy man, he's only in it for the thrill. He's not in it for the work, and that is a waste of resources and potential. Proverbs 24, 30 say this, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of a man void of understanding, and lo, it was all grown over with thorns, and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. He's observing laziness. Then I saw and considered it well, I looked upon it and received instruction. The lazy man didn't teach him something. The product of laziness taught him something. That's what people see, what your life produces. The lazy man, walls broken down, thorns and nettles, Notice what it says, what, did he, what instruction did this person receive? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and thy want as an armed man. He received instruction by looking at the product of laziness. If that's what laziness produces, I don't want anything of it. Now, that word uh, travaileth there in verse number 34, so shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth. That's a prowler or a bandit. So that lazy person thinks, hey, everything is going great, no problem at all in life. You know, I'm getting by, I'm skating by, I'm not having to do my work, but who cares? And it says, just like a bandit or a prowler pounces on you. That's what's going to happen with your life. One day, the chickens are going to come home to roost. That's what's going to happen. Also, it says, in thy want as an armed man. In other words, scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. So we need to learn from the person who is lazy, but we don't want to imitate them. And here's something that we do understand, though, is that laziness is not always the cause of poverty. Don't assume somebody who is in poverty is lazy. However, laziness is the for sure way to get there. Amen? Also, they whitewash in action with excuses. They whitewash in action with excuses. One of Coach O'Hara's, which was my high school football coach, one of his favorite things to say to us, the worst Day for football practice was always on a Saturday after we lost when coach would call us in. We're going to look at the film. And he would stay up all night looking and watching the film. And then you'd have to watch film in front of all the other players. And, you know, they'd be there with remote and slow motion. Mulford, how did you miss that block? Well, uh, uh, you know, and this is what he'd say to everybody. 
Don't give me excuses, give me results. And that's what he said all the time. Don't give me excuses, give me results. You see, the lazy person, they whitewash their inaction with excuses. Proverbs 20, verse 4 says, The sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold, therefore shall he beg and harvest and have nothing. In other words, the lazy person says, It's not convenient. It's cold outside. It's going to be work. I really don't like to go out during this time of the day, this time of the year. Here's two things to understand about that proverb. He did not plow by reason of the cold. Well, first of all, because he just experienced the previous harvest. You see, the lazy person does not foresee the need of the future. He just experienced the harvest. Maybe he got a few crops. So he says, you know what? I'm not going to plow for next year's harvest because... I have enough right now. So the lazy person does what? They don't plan for the future. Also, notice this, the lazy person, then it says this, shall he beg and harvest and have nothing. So not only does he plan, but notice this, he begs and harvests. It is a shame. You have to understand in this culture to beg is a shame. He becomes a laughing stock to everybody else. Here's what I just want to encourage you with tonight. Beware of being satisfied with past victories that keep you from working toward future ones. Here a lazy man stays inside when it's cold and he missed his door of opportunity. Proverbs 26, 16 says, a sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. In other words, a lazy person thinks that their shortcut, their easy way, their easy course of action is better than seven experienced people. And that word render a reason means to examine by tasting or life experience. So that lazy person, they disregard the experience of seven. What's the, what's the word picture of seven? Perfection, right? Seven people who've done it. They've tasted, they've experienced it, and they say their way is better. Proverbs 26, 13 says, A slothful man saith, there's a lion in the way. A lion is in the streets. The slugger then uses absurd excuses to get out of work. Have you ever ex experienced that in your life with your coworkers? They use the most absurd excuses to get out of work. Perhaps in this situation, the sluggard has even convinced himself that he's a realist and not actually a lazy person. You know... It could happen. There could be a lion in, the, is there one out? No, but it could happen. You see, they've convinced themselves that their laziness is actually practical. Proverbs twenty-two thirteen echoes that same thing. The slothful man saith, there's a lion without, I shall be slain in the streets. In other words, you can always find an excuse if you don't want to do something. And, and here, the Proverbs, they give us uh, hyperbole. I don't want to go out because I might get eaten. However, one excuse is just as good as another. You see, they whitewash their inaction with excuses, but also they weary others through irritation. They weary others through irritation. Have you ever heard of... Chinese water torture. Just a simple drop on the forehead that would continue and continue and continue and continue, and it would drive prisoners crazy. You see, that is like a lazy person. They weary others through irritation. Proverbs 10, 26 says, As vinegar to the teeth and as smoke to the eyes, so is the slugger to them that send him. Now, there's two similes used to portray the aggravation 
and sending a lazy person on a mission. First of all, vinegar to the teeth. That is an unpleasant and irritating experience. Now, uh, if you, any of y'all have ever had gallbladder attacks, my wife dealt with that for a while, and she would drink apple cider vinegar to try to help with the gallbladder attacks. Any of you ladies ever done that before? All right, none. All right, some of you guys are like, yes, all right, thank you. And I would feel so bad because she would almost just, oh, just to drink that vinegar. She understands when you say it's vinegar to the teeth. The person you ask to do a job and you come back and they don't do it, it's like vinegar to your teeth. And then it says this, smoke to the eyes. Not only does smoke to the eyes actually physically burn, but it hinders your ability to make progress. So you work with a lazy person and it will affect your output. You see, they weary others through irritation. So what are the consequences too? the consequences of laziness? What does Proverbs tell us that laziness will lead to? Point number two, consequences of laziness. It tells us in Proverbs 10, 4, he becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth shame. Here, that word dealeth with a slack hand. In the Hebrew, it really literally means a palm of slackness. And the hand is emphasized when it comes to laziness because it is the instrument of physical labor. In fact, it even contrasts in these verses the difference between the slack hand or the palm of slackness and the diligent hand. Have you ever heard the phrase, they're asleep at the wheel, or asleep on the job? You see, that's what this verse is conveying here. They have a slack hand. They sleep in the harvest. They're asleep. Their hands don't know how to actually do work. So what are the consequences? A, they will not achieve their desires. They will not achieve their desires. In Proverbs 13, 4, it says, The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. This verse tells us, and this is true, a lazy person does have an appetite for things, but they don't have an appetite for work. So they will never find true satisfaction. Maybe you want to think of it this way. They have dreams, but they don't have desires. They have a want, but they don't have a will. The diligent person, though, it says that they will not just be satisfied and find satisfaction, they will be abundantly satisfied. They will be made fat. In other words, they just won't have their needs met. They will have excess. Proverbs 21, 25 says, the desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. Much like how it talks about if if you're a coveter and you can pierce yourself through the love of money is the root of all evil, uh, you Those who've covered after, they've pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The lazy person who refused to work, it says that he is killing himself. He coveteth greedily all the day long, but the righteous giveth and spareth not. They don't achieve their desires. And because they can't ever achieve their desires, you know what else is a, it tells us is a characteristic of them? They can't be generous to other people. You see, the lazy person never has the opportunity to be generous because they're not blessed in their work with abundance. The lazy man wants it all for himself. He's a coveter. However, it tells us, the righteous giveth and spareth not. The diligent man, the hard worker, he's benevolent. He has the resources 
because he's worked hard to be a blessing to other people. Not only does he meet his desires, but the diligent worker, what does he get to do? Help meet other people's needs and desires. But also they will live in destitution. They will live in destitution. Proverbs 19.15 says, The slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. Laziness brings on sleep, and a sleeping soul then suffers hunger. Notice the progression. You know, I'm not going to work today. I'm going to call in sick. I need to go to the grocery store. But I don't have any money. It's called the snowball effect. Proverbs 10, uh, 20, 13 says this, Love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. When we think about this verse, there's a, just something that really just came to me in this, is that we need to look for opportunities not look at the obstacles. When it comes to work, we need to look for the opportunities, not the obstacles. The lazy person, they say, uh, you know what, there's just too many problems, there's just too much, I can't do it. The diligent person, they look, they open up their eyes. What work needs to be done? And notice this, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. A for sure way to live in poverty is to be lazy and refuse to work. You will live in destitution if you choose to be lazy. But also, they will experience difficulty. They will experience difficulty. Proverbs fifteen nineteen says this, The way of the slothful man is as a hedge of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. I got to tell you, this verse was very convicting for me. Because every single one of us will probably have a similar experience as I'm about to share with you. How many of you, without a raise of hands, will let the guilty go unnoticed and unpunished right now, have a project that you keep looking at? Perhaps maybe it's tax strip in the carpet of your home that is exposed and you walk past the tax strip, and you say, oh, oh, tax strip gets me every time. Step over it. And you do that for two years. Take care of the tax strip, right? See, this person, the way of the slothful man is as a hedge of thorns. Listen, you don't have to keep getting pricked by the thorns. Take the thorns out and enjoy the hedge. He can make life a whole lot better for himself and others if he would just tend to the priorities. Instead, he leaves the thorns and he's constantly getting pricked. What am I telling you is get the priorities done. When you have the opportunity to do it, do it then. Otherwise, you will experience difficulty. Don't let it keep bugging you. Just like those thorns, they will be a hindrance. They will be difficult. Take care of the difficulty. Also, they will remain in dependency, in, the, in dependency, D. They will remain in dependency. Proverbs 12, 24 says, The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. You see, the hard worker is able to have charge or rule over their own work. And all of us who've been in jobs or maybe... Uh, you've been in a construction job or you've been in a job where they have foremen and managers and you work hard, you know what the boss says? Hey, yeah, you can do whatever you want to do. Oh, <laughs> you get to work on the garbage today. Why? Because they know they can trust a hard worker to get the job done. And what do they give to the poor worker? The worst job. You know the person who works hard on the job and does the tasks that they've been assigned to do? They're invaluable to the company. 
They can go to the boss and say, I need a raise or I'm leaving. And the boss says, you got a raise. But the lazy person is forced to work for the diligent just to survive. They live in dependency than on the hard work and the enterprise of others. The lazy person works on the hard, lives on the hard work and enterprise of others. Don't live in dependency. Be that hard worker. And then let's close with this, a correlation about laziness. The correlation about laziness. There are three wonderful word pictures that God gives us in his word. It shows us God's will, what God wants, versus truly laziness. In he- Hebrews 6, 9, I just put one verse in your notes, but just for context, I'm going to read the whole thing bre- uh, quickly here. It says, but beloved... We are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. What accompanies salvation? Work. That's what it's saying. You minister, you serve. Verse 11, and we desire that every one of you should do, uh, show the same diligence to the full assurance and hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them through faith and patience inherit the promises. Here's what Scripture is telling us. It's giving us a word picture of what it means to work hard and not be lazy from the, the faithful. You see, the faithful were not slothful. They were diligent. You see, your laziness says something about your faith. Lazy people are poor testimony. So the first word picture that we're given about laziness is that if you are a follower of Jesus, it tells us this, that something ought to accompany your salvation. And what is that? Working in service, of course, obviously in service to the Lord. The practical aspect of it is, is that if, if you're surely not working in your own life, you're surely not going to work for the Lord. And then in Luke 16, we're given another picture. And this word picture is from the unfaithful, actually. Is from what we consider Luke 16, this parable of this unfaithful steward, is such a good example of bad behavior. I hate to put it that way, but it's really a good example of bad behavior. Here's what it tells us in Luke 16, and many of you probably know this parable. And he said unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man which had a steward. The same was accused of him that he had wasted his goods. He was lazy. He was a steward who was supposed to be managing his master's resources, and he wasted his, he was that person that, that was a destroyer, as we talked about earlier in the message, of his master's goods. This, and when he had called him, came time to give an account I'm seeing laziness. I'm seeing things that aren't going well. When he called him, he said to him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer a steward. He says, All right, I want you to go get the books, give an account, because you're about to be fired. I'm putting you on notice. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship which he was undeserving of, correct? I cannot dig to beg, I'd be ashamed. Remember, this is a shaming culture, right? I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called unto every one his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, how much owest thou, my Lord? And he said, in a hundred measures of oil. He said unto him, take thy bill, which uh, that's around... Uh, about, I think, 350 acres of olive trees, what they would produce in a year. That's a lot of oil. He said to him, take that bill, sit down right uh, quickly, and write 50. Hey, guess what? You get 50% discount right now, pay the bill. 
Then he said unto another, How much owest thou? He said unto him, A hundred measures of wheat. He said unto him, Take thy bill and write four score. Give me eighty. So here's what that unjust person, as he was lazy, didn't manage, didn't take care of things, didn't go collect bills, did not do what his master said to do. And his master said, all right, you're about to lose your job. Give me an account. Well, he had to think for a minute, what am I going to do? Well, since this is an honor and shame society, I'm going to go do somebody a favor. So they're going to owe me a favor. If he fires me, the guy that I just gave a 50% discount to, you're going to give me a job or else I'm going to say, you don't know how to pay your debts either. You guys are probably saying, Pastor Seth, this is a terrible, Jesus is giving a parable about this? Because guess what happens? It tells us this, and the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of the light. So he's saying, how does this guy get commended for that kind of behavior? Here is the principle. We don't have time to go all the way through it tonight uh, in this passage of Scripture. But the principle is, is even the ungodly, unfaithful, unjust know the importance of securing their future. Even as lazy as this guy was, he said, I've got to secure a future. In Scripture, you get there through working. Then notice what it tells us. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful in that which is much. And he that is unjust in the least is also unjust also in much. If you therefore have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? If you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. He'll hate one or love the other. You can't serve God and man. And here is what Jesus was getting at. We need to make sure we are working hard to secure an eternal future. Let's not be lazy here. Let's be faithful here. Let's work hard here so we are securing a future in heaven. So here's three things uh, quickly that we're going to see from Proverbs chapter 6. And we'll close there in Proverbs chapter number 6 if you want to turn there. Is the last word picture that we're given is from creation, and that's from the ant. Well, he gives us an example. It says in Proverbs 6, 6, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gather, gathereth her food in the harvest. So he gives us an example of the ant. In other words, when he says, go to the ant, you sluggard, he's saying this, take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and be wise. People are ruined because of laziness and irresponsibility, but the ant has initiative and diligence and he notes, Solomon notes this, though they don't have a supervisor, they don't have somebody over there putting their thumb on them, what do they know how to do? They know how to work. They don't need prodding. Go to the ant. Ants possess instinctive motivation and discipline that we can also develop through wisdom. They do not just labor for the sake of staying busy. They are prudent because the expectation of future needs. Elsewhere, Solomon observes that ants, while small and frail, are nevertheless wise creatures. Ants aren't strong, but they store up food all summer. They gather and stockpile food in summer months, and they have plenty, and they will have enough to make it through the scant months of winter. But the lazy, they don't know how to do that, do they? Also, there's an examination. There's an examination in Proverbs 6. Notice verse 9. It says, How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? So he gives us the example. Ants, they're industrious, they're diligent, they're hard workers. And then there's an examination. At some point, we need to assess life's choices. We must examine ourselves. 
We must realize things are in disrepair. They're in ruin. We're in poverty. We are struggling. Something needs to change. How long will thou sleep? When will you rise out of your sleep? Are you going to examine yourself and realize, I've got to make some changes in my habits. I've become lazy. And then here's the exhortation in verses 10 through 11. It says, yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and thy want as an armed man. We looked at that verse earlier, but here is the exhortation. He says, go to the ant. Look at them. They prepare they work hard, and he's actually a sarcastic here of laziness. You fold the hands to rest. It's taught, called idleness. It says, don't be idle. Don't go to sleep. Don't be asleep at the wheel. You know, the Apostle Paul, he echoes Solomon in the New Testament and he entreats Christians to warn those who are lazy in 1 Thessalonians 5. And he teaches that sluggards should not be allowed to freeload, explaining this. He says that there are some among you that are idle and disruptive. They're not busy. They're busy bodies. Such people we commend and urge in the Lord Jesus to settle down and earn food that they eat. That's what it tells us there in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. So God calls us to be hardworking and diligent and to give ourselves wholly to the matters of faith. So we need to be adding to our faith. We need to be working. So I want to close with this. There are three areas that we may need to improve. There may be three areas in our lives tonight where we're experiencing laziness. First of all, physical laziness. Are we neglecting work in our duties? Are you physically lazy? Are you neglecting work in your duties? Also, mental laziness. Is there discipline in your mind? Are you challenging yourself? Are you reading good theological books? Not just, obviously, you want to spend time in God's Word. Are you being challenged? Are you, are you reading? Is there laziness in your mind? And then lastly, I just want to ask you, is there spiritual laziness? Are you neglecting to serve? Ne neglecting to pray? Neglecting to read Scripture? Neglecting to use your God-given talents? You see, none of us like the sluggard. None of us like the slothful. But we all have a tendency to fall into that trap if we don't choose to be diligent. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the challenge that You give us from Proverbs and how we don't want anything in our life to resemble the slothful person, the lazy person. God, I pray that uh, You would help us tonight those who may be dealing with laziness in their spiritual walk, laziness in, in, in their, their mental maturity, laziness in their physical bodies. God, I pray that tonight we would decide we're going to be diligent because we can see what happens. We will learn from the lazy person how we ought not to do life. So God, I pray that uh, we'd be challenged to work hard. We'd work out our faith. You've called us to do that. Thank you that you are working in us, both the will and the do of your good pleasure. Help us to lead, uh, lean on you and yield to you and your Holy Spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you. Thank you all for being here tonight. You're dismissed.